Hi, my name is Banan Yang. I'm a professor of mathematical sciences at NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, this is a recording for BPPB Friday seminar on Zoom um, on May 27, 2022. Um, some of the works that I show here are from collaborations with Zhangli Pen from UIC and um, Andrew Resney from Cleveland State University. So with these two collaborators, we have a collaborative grant from NSF um, to work on Primacelia. And I personally am looking for a graduate student um, to support to work on these projects with us. So it all started when I visited Christopher Jacobs lab at Columbia. Um, so Chris was a um, um, bio um, mechanicist who whose uh, expertise was um, uh, primary civilian. Uh, so unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. So when I visited his lab, he showed me that he can actually uh, visualize the bending of the primary cilium, which is this filamentary structure here, by using microfluid uh, flow chamber. Um, so the air red arrow here indicates the direction of the flow. So as this movie uh, keeps playing, you can see that this filament, which is the primary cilium, is, uh, is a protruding on the apical side of the cell, which is laying on the substrate. And then when the flow is turned on, it actually bends. And then when the flow is turned off in the second half of the movie, the, the primary cilium uh, moves back, recoils a little bit. Um, so in case you can't see the image uh, in the movie too well, here are a few uh, steel frames. You can see um, the, the detailed structure. Um, so in Chris's lab, they also use different um, fluorescent microscopy to visualize the cilium by fluorescent dye in the, the ciliary membrane, right? So here are a few examples of the profile of the cilium under flowing conditions. And sometimes I even see a defect in the uh, cilium structure uh, under flow. So this usually is under very strong flow and then the cilium, the microtubule uh, doublets may have um, um, the uh, defected due to the strong bending. So here's the outline. Um, so first I'll give you a brief introduction of primary cilium, which is shown here. So really it's a microtubule based structure with nine doublets um, in the cross section shown here. So these nine doublets are enclosed by a ciliary membrane. Um, so this whole uh, compartment, enclosed compartment is referred to as a axonym. And these doublets here all originate from the cent uh, central zone in the basal body here, which is connected to a, a daughter central zone. So these two are the microtubule organization centers when the cell is out of the mitotic cycle. And further, we can see that um, this uh, basal body is, has actually um, rootlets or appendages that go further, deeper, uh, further and deeper than then the basal body to connect to the interior of the cell, sometimes the cytoskeleton, sometimes even the nucleus, right? So, um, so first I'll give you three aspects of the primary cilia mechanics. The first is in terms of its axonym uh, rigidity. Second is in terms of its basal anchorage and pivoting. And then um, I'll show you just as the uh, microtubules are uh, anisotropic, and so is the primary cilium uh, in terms of its rigidity and dependence on its contour length. And then um, I'll show you how we can um, find evidence of primary cilium mechanical sensing. One is by its adaptation um, from mechanical sensing, and the other is how the cytoskeleton responds to the stress transmitted from the primary cilium. Okay. So primacillium, of course, is a is a now quite well known orga organism. Um, that um that's what that was first reported by Paul Langrenham, a German physiologist, more than hundred years ago. Um, so here 
his some of his drawings of um primacyan from three types of cells. And now it's known that primacyan could be found in almost all cell types when as long as they are not in uh in uh, my my cycle, right? Um and it's also found that um primacyan could be resorbed. Um so the, the axonal structure could actually dissemble and then the centrioles could actually move back to the to around the nucleus to perform their uh, duties um, to um, to form spindles and then to facilitate cell division. Um, so when the when the primary cilians are not cilia are uh, dysfunctional, then it's also known that their pathologies lead to all kinds of um, diseases such as um, um, such as kidney disease, for example, or kidney cysts and also liver problems, and also it could be um, um, retinal dysfunction. So, um, um, so the, the biological function of the primary cilium, um has not been well established until just recently, uh, where it's, um, first it was speculated that due to the bending, uh, since it doesn't really move, uh, it's really quite passive. So, uh, as it bends under flow under external stimuli, right? So um, there may be um, mechanical uh, sensing uh, follow uh, due to um, due to the uh, messenger uh, such as calcium uh, that transmits a mechanical signal, right? So um, in the kidney, for example, right? We have this array of um, uh, of cilia in the in the kidney tube. Right, so if you have a flow going from left to right, then uh, collectively, right, these cells would sense a flow, uh, and then, um, and then they could communicate with each other through this mechanical sensing um, of the of the common flow in in the kidney tube. Now, the connection between the mechanical bending and uh, mechanical bending and the chemical signal is not established until. Um, right home uh, 2010, where they actually find the correlation between the bending of the cilium and also the calcium wave um, inside the cell by, um, by periodically uh, turning on and off the flow every 30 seconds uh, after five minutes of exposure. And then um, you can see this high correlation of the calcium wave inside the cell uh, that follows right after um, the the flow, um, the periodic flow um, that's um, being, that's constructed inside this uh, rotating channel, right? So basically, what happens is that every time the the flow is turned on, which is in the gray bar, then the calcium signal begins to grow, and and when the flow is turned off, then the calcium signal goes down. So back and forth, back and forth, uh, they establish a strong correlation between the bending of obsidian due to external flow and also the initiation and the uh, decreasing of the calcium signal inside the cell. Now, how does this work? Right? So basically the mechano mechanical deflection of obsidian has to be um, detected at the molecular level so that the calcium uh, messenger to actually um, um, initiate the uh, intracellular wave inside the cell, right? So, so people speculate for a very long time, and now it's confirmed that the polycystic network will be the the main uh, mechanical sensing channel um, that are distributed along the uh, ciliary membrane and also near the basal body. So, when the cilium uh, bends on the flow, right? So, some of the uh, polycystic network will be stretched and activated, and then the calcium would Influx will be initiated, and the calcium will go through the axonem uh, into the um, into the cytoplasm, and thus initiates the um, the intracellular uh, calcium wave uh, through further um, signaling pathways such as CICR. Okay, calcium induced calcium release. Now, um, so at as a first uh, attempt to understand the biomechanics of primary cilium, all I want to do is to just figure out how the mechanics works, right? So, so let's separate the, the chemical signaling 
from the mechanical bending for now and just try to understand how the primacillian could bend under external flow um, as a mechanical problem. Right. So so to model to achieve the, this um task, right? So first I will assume that the primacillian is like a slender body, which is characterized by its um slenderness beta, which is a function of the aspect ratio, right? Epsilon. So epsilon will be the diameter of the of the cilium axonym to the contour length of the primary cilium. So usually it's it's of order um, 10 to the minus one to 10 to minus two. So it's very small. So that justified the the usage of the of a center body uh, for for modeling. Right? So basically we just want the the, the stress density to balance uh, at equilibrium state. Right. So so here eta would be the drag coefficient, right? So this would be the drag force, and this would be the uh, the, uh, the the aspect ratio due to the standardness of the filament, and that will give you the the um, the stress distribution, the load. Um, so we're interested in um, this uh, flagellar rigidity here, right? Which is um, Newton meter square. So by fitting the a profile to the experimental observation, which are the symbols here, right? We can actually estimate the the bending rigid uh, the fragile rigidity, right? So here is the mean of all this um, um comparison between uh the the center body modeling and the equilibrium uh, profile measure from Christopher Jacobs lab. So you can see that the average is about eight point four times ten to the minus twenty three newton meter square. Now, how does this compare to the the fragile rigidity of the microtubule, right? So remember now there are nine doublets here inside the axonym. So in the literature, we can find that the fragile rigidity of a microtubule uh, ranges quite a bit depending on how it's measured and under what condition, right? So this is summarized in um, Kikumoto's paper in 2006. So depending on how it's measured, then you can see the fragile rigidity of a single microtubule could vary uh, quite a bit in, in this range. And also, right, it's shown that the fragile rigidity depends on the microtubule length, right? So of course, this is not new, um, but then this also gives a hint that the persistent length of microtubule may also depend on the microtubule uh, contour length as well. So this will be um, important uh, as we uh, move to the, um, the, the later part of the of the presentation, where I show you that the uh, this kind of length dependent persistent length is actually a, a, a consequence of the uh, anisotropy of the microtubule um, doublets inside the axiom. Okay, so once we um, um, construct a model, then we can actually um, um, right. So first we measure uh, have a qualitative measurement of the fragile rigidity, and then we can further um, construct the, the model by refining the basal anchorage. And so now we have a rotational spring uh, for the basal body to quantify the, the anchorage. And, and this basal anchorage could be um, could be actually measured by, um, by, the, uh, by comparing the profile between experiments and the model, right? So once we have that, then we can actually uh, compare the dynamics of the primary cilium under flowing condition, right? So here's an example where the flow is turned on at t equal to zero, and then the cilium uh, actually uh, bends from left to right, right? So t goes from zero to 4.6 seconds, and then uh, at t equal to five seconds, the flow is turned off. Then we see the cilium actually um, tends to recoil, but doesn't really recoil completely to its uh, initial position t equal to zero, which is very common in um, in the experiments, right? So, um, so if you just measure the the tip position as a function of time, right? So these the symbols are from experiments, and the solid line are from the uh, slender body with the rotational uh, spring for the basal anchorage. So you can see uh, we can get reasonable agreement from beginning to end. And furthermore, if you just compute the profile at each uh, uh, instant of time, um, we can actually see that um, it's actually a pretty good agreement uh, point-wise, right? Even though it's not perfect because 
um, there's some uncertainty in measurements and also um, uh, the, the comparison may not be perfect, but overall you can see right, the model does give a very good quantitative um, picture of the primary cilia, right? So here the take home message is that in addition to an elastic um, filament, right, the basal body, uh, the basal anchorage as a rotational spring is also important um, for us to uh, actually have a good comparison between the modeling uh, profile and dynamics of the cilium uh, and the experimental observation. Right. Now, um, um, it's very common to use uh, external fluid flow, micro, microfluid channel uh, flow to deflect the primary cilium. But what happens doing that is that the whole cell is exposed to this um, uh, viscous stress imposed by the external uh, fluid stimuli. Right. Now, um, Battle uh, in 2015 used um, optical tweezer to just um, bend the primary cilium by trapping the cilium tip. Right. So this way, they can minimize uh, the stimulation of the rest of the cell and then just look at how the cell will respond to this kind of uh, bending uh, due to the uh, the optical tweezer trapping the cilium tip right, and then bending the whole uh, acetylene. So they found that um, the, the cilium fluctuation are correlated with basal body fluctuation. Um, so, so, so we are motivated by those findings and then we, um, so we meaning um, with Zhongli uh, and uh, Andy, we started to look at how this uh, correlation could actually give us more information in terms of the mechanical property of the of the primary cilia, right? So we want to trap the optical uh, trap the uh, primary cilia tip by an optical trap, and then uh, we want to measure, for example, the the parent uh, cilia spring constant, and then and then try to see if we can actually um, say something about the biomechanics of the primary cilia. So we model this uh, trap, this uh, uh, force system as a force oscillator that's under uh, over damped. And then uh, you can see that, um, right, so based on the, the, the fluctuation at the basal body and also uh, near the tip, right? So we have two kinds of, um, uh, random processes here. Um, and then by computing uh, the steady uh, uh, state right, of, of this uh, force oscillator with uh, fluctuations, both in the both at the tip and at the basal body here, theta one and theta two, we can actually back out the 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 cilian, uh, spring constant as a function of the persistent length and also the contour length, where this is a uh, persistent length is uh, given here based on the microtubule uh, anisotropic uh, property, right? So then we can actually show that um, the parent spring constant for the uh, cilium is actually uh, related to um, the two other spring constants uh, in this way, right? Now, um, so how, how does the persistent length uh, length dependence of the microtubule persistent come about? Right? So this is actually uh, um, investigated more than 10 years ago by um, the group at Brown, Brown University, where they show that if the microtubule is modeled as a, an isotropic shell, then, then they can calculate analytically that its persistent length uh, is actually dependent on the contour length of this anisotropic shell, right? So, so we use this um, as a model and then we uh, fit um, the spring constant to the experimental data. So then you can see, right, so so that the experimental data are these symbols here and the, uh, and the fit is this bull curve here. We can get very good agreements. Um, so, so this sort of tells us that, right, so whatever uh, the mechanical property of microtubules uh, are, right, they are reflected in the doublets and, and also reflected in the primary cilium axiom mechanical property, okay? So, so that leads me to the, the last half part of the talk, which is the mechanical sensing of the primary cilium. Right? So with uh, Christopher Jacob and his graduate student, uh, Anne Wen uh, at the time, we look at the 
adaptation of the Cedar and excellent in terms of its um, fragile rigidity and also the, the basal anchorage um, as a function of the time dependent uh, external stimuli. So what we do here is that, so Anne is an experimentalist, so she did all the experiments here. So she actually um, um, imposed um, this periodic um, external flow onto the uh, primary cilium uh, at different uh, duration in different periods. And then she found that um, the, the primary cilium actually um, stiffens as the uh, external stimuli periodically um, turns on and off. Right? So, so basically, right, so what happens is that the, the acetylation sites um, get stronger, so therefore the, the, the microtubule droplets get stiffer as the stimuli um, uh, is uh, turning on and off and on and off periodically. And furthermore, they also found that um, the, the rotational angle of the primacy also has uh, plastic deformation and, and also it's, um, it's not a simple function of, of time as the stimuli continues to um, be turn, turned on and off. Okay, so that's the first part that we can um, be sure that um, the adaptation of the cilium is a direct consequence of the mechanical sensing of the primary cilium. And then um, um, later, we also uh, work with a postdoc with, um, uh, with Christopher Jacob, who actually um, used this oscillatory uh, shear flow chamber to, um, to shake the whole uh, culture of the cell, of cells. And then uh, what she found is that once the, um, once the, um, you can visualize the cytoskeleton, then you can see that the cytoskeleton stress distribution is highly related to the, um, the, uh, the stress transmitted from the primary cilia. Okay, so so that means right. So once the primary cilia is um, is bent under the flowing condition, then it transmits stress down to the cytoskeleton, and then um, then that leads to the stress distribution in the cytoskeleton as shown here. Um, okay, so um, now other groups also have um, generated evidence, pieces of many many different pieces of evidence that show the primary cilium are indeed mechanical sensors. But then um, one word that's really, really not, uh, worth noticing is that um, Dilling, uh, Dilling's group at Harvard actually showed that um, the, the, the calcium influx is actually um, not from the excellent. This is their conclusion. Right? So basically they conclude that the calcium influx may actually come from the sad skeleton and then the calcium goes up to the, the axon. Right? So this is very different from the traditional paradigm where, right, as I show you at the beginning, right? So where the, the polycysteine network, a polycysteine complex actually is the is responsible for the intracellular uh, calcium influx here from the axon to the rest of the cell, right? Through so, so the cytoskeleton and the cytoplasm. So what Delling is proposing based on their finding is that um, the, the calcium influx into the axon is actually quite small and almost um, negligible, but then um, they do find significant calcium influx into the uh, axon from the cytoplasm, right? So, so their conclusion is that maybe all this um, calcium influx does not really initiate from the mechanosensitive sensitive channel uh, polycystic network, for example, uh, on the axon, but actually maybe uh, near the base or further down um, deeper than the base. So that's one thing that um, that still is a focus of many research groups around the world. Um, but I also want to um, mention that um, even the, the microtubule structure uh, inside the axonym is not as simple as the doublet all the way from the from the transition zone to the tip of the cilium. Right? The transition, transition zone is where the triplet actually transitions to the doublets. So here's a electron microscopy of the 
primary cilium microtubule doublets, right? So here it actually shows how the microtubule structures um, varies inside the axonome, right? So here you see the nine doublets and then triplets, right? So that's uh, at the basal body. And now this is going up towards the tip. So you see that some of the doublets transition to singlets and then they stop, right? So not all of them made it all the way to the tip, right? Furthermore, right, you can see that um, they're not perfectly aligned around the rim of the axonym, right? So basically they're, they're sort of twisted um, and then uh, arranged in very different way depending on which cross section you're looking at, right? So that's what we uh, recently found um, in the simulations that we've been doing uh, with Zhang Li and, and Andy, right? So basically uh, Zhang Li and his student found that um, um, right, depending on the the the, the load, right, the, the the distribution of the nine doublets could actually be very different um, uh, from the perfectly symmetric distribution. Okay, so so here's a conclusion. Right, so basically, I hope I have shown you that um, we have a very good um, model that could be used to understand the biomechanics of primicillium in terms of its fragile rigidity basal anchorage pivoting, and also uh, length dependencies of the uh, persistent length, and also the fragile rigidity, right? So, um, so then we ask the question, right? So what, what is the mechanical uh, consequence of microtubule doublet distribution inside the ciliary axiom, right? So maybe because of this, um, um, distribution of doublet distribution, um, so spatial arrangements, right? So maybe that's why the, the measurement of the um, uh, primary cilium fragile rigidity varies quite a bit. Um, um, however, that's not, of course, that's not the same uh, as in the measurement of a single microtubule, right? So, um, so well, how, how does the, how does all these factors will come into play when it comes to uh, determine the uh, primary cilium uh, fragile rigidity, right? So, um, so furthermore, right? So we also want to um, have a, a very good model to determine um, how the uh, calcium signaling pathway works in uh, tandem with the mechanical um, deflection of the primary cilium accident, for example, right? So, so that. Uh, remains to be future work. And um, I hope uh, this talk gives you some idea about the first of the primary cilium and also um, how it has been understood in terms of mechanical sensors and uh, how we can actually model it and, and how we can actually use experiments to, um, to examine its mechanical sensing properties. Okay, thank you.